Hello everyone and welcome to chapter 12, the origin and diversification of life on earth. So now we're starting to get into some topics that you might find a little more interesting than the previous chapters. Uh, if you enjoyed evolution, uh, you will also enjoy this chapter. As always, I'm going to kind of just skip through these learning objectives. I feel like if you want to read them, you can, but I don't need to. So starting out, what is life? Uh, how did it begin? Um, well, first of all, complex organic molecules arise in non-living environments, and that is how things kind of started. Uh, so the definition of life itself, which sounds like a existential question, um, but we are just going off of the biological terminology of life, uh, the ability to replicate big one, and by the presence of metabolic activity. So that is a very textbook definition of life, the ability to replicate, and also uh, for an organism to have a, a metabolic um, experience, if you will. So the ability to convert um, some type of food into energy, whether that's sunlight or um, water or other nutrients. So Earth began about 4.5 billion years ago from dust and gas as it cooled. Um, a crust started to form uh, and that would have been about 3.8 million years ago. So it would have taken a little while for things to cool down enough for there to have been a crust. Everything was kind of hot and on fire up until that point. What we can find from fossil records is something kind of like bacteria uh, cells found about 3.4 million years ago. So that's once everything has cooled down um, a lot. Uh, but we have no idea how those cells could have gotten there. Um, one of the theories is that there was a meteor and it hit Earth and that meteor was carrying um, cells on it, which then gave rise to everything that we know on Earth today. Uh, although I am gonna give you a few other options here as opposed to that theory. So the vast majority of scientists believe life originated on Earth in several distinct phases. Uh, so the first phase is the formation of small molecules containing carbon and hydrogen. Back in the early times uh, on Earth, the conditions were not fantastic. Definitely would not be able to support life as we know it today. Um, on the side there, you're going to see a list of various components that would have been found at this time. You're going to notice that something's missing, and that is oxygen. There is no oxygen uh, at this time. That doesn't come until much later. Almost all of these are present due to uh, volcanoes constantly erupting. Uh, and then we're also going to see some water, though. Uh, lots of water, lots of oceans. And we see these nice warm little pools, which Darwin called uh, warm little ponds, which is where life, uh, or at least the building blocks of life, would have started. To test this theory, um, these two gentlemen, Yuri and Miller, uh, in 1953 composed an experiment where in a flask they put water, dihydrogen, methane, and ammonia, uh, and then they kind of applied some lightning to it or an electrical discharge. Um, then they let it cool to precipitate any compounds that could be formed there. Um, then they examined the contents at least five different amino acids were detected. And you might be thinking that probably took a really long time. It only took a few days for them to see this result. Um, so this sort of, if you've ever seen the Powerpuff Girls, this sort of combination of sugar, spice, and everything nice with a little bit of chemical X created the perfect conditions for these amino acids to start being present, to start being created, which again, 
that would start the building blocks of life as we know it today. So this is a potential of how uh, life could have arisen. So cells and self-replicating systems evolved together to create the first life that we saw on Earth. Uh, so this is sort of a predecessor to the second phase, which we will get into here in just a second. So these self-replicating information containing molecules would have arose after the generation of organic molecules like amino acids that we saw being created in phase one through uh, Urey and Miller's experiments. Researchers believe that a molecule with catalytic properties, kind of like an enzyme, uh, was necessary uh, for that all to have happened, though. So going into phase two with all that information, we have the formation of those self-replicating information containing molecules. They would have been very similar to RNA. So RNA can catalyze the reactions necessary for replication of a nucleic acid. But is RNA the precursor to cellular life? It's really close to being considered living, but it doesn't quite meet the criteria. It can replicate, but it can't metabolize. And that's a very big, um, important factor, 50% of how we classify something as being living. So technically, we're going to say RNA is not the first um, cellular life on Earth, but it is definitely the precursor to it. Jumping into phase three, which is the development of a membrane enabling metabolism and creating the first cells. So membranes, remember, are semi-permeable barriers that separate the inside of a cell from its external environment. That's what we learned from chapter four when we were talking about cells. Membranes are going to make numerous aspects of metabolism possible, and that is because it allows there to be a difference in concentrations of chemicals inside and outside of the cell. So these self-replicating molecules um, would have needed a membrane to make life possible. But how did it happen? So this is sort of just a summary of all that good stuff. Um, one of the things I want to point out about membranes is that membranes are composed of phospholipids. And in water, phospholipids form spheres. You can do this experiment at home if you'd like. Take a little bit of like whatever oil you have, maybe like vegetable oil, and put just a drop of it into a glass of water. You'll notice that it forms a circle. It doesn't spread out. Um, it doesn't create a line. It doesn't create a, I don't know, like a hexagon or an octagon. It creates a circle or a sphere. And what happens uh, when we have these phospholipids um, just forming spheres in water is it might surround some of these uh, self-replicating information containing molecules and thus create a membrane. So it's still kind of on the fence and a little unclear about how that would have happened if that happened. Um, but that is the uh, kind of top theory that we've got going on here. Okay, so moving on to what we have seen um, when it comes to fossil records that support some of the theories that we were just talking about. So we do have uh, a fossil record of an ancient prokaryotic uh, type cell. Um, we know that it's more prokaryote than it is eukaryote because it possesses no nucleus, no organelles, and it has a circular strand of genetic information. We know that this fossil is about 3.4 billion years old, and that would have been kind of around the time that we would have expected to see cells um, or at least cellular life start forming. So that is like some really cool stuff. So if you take a look at the supporting evidence, um, so we have the age of the rock uh, around the fossil. We have the size of the impression, um, which would have been, you know, quite small. Um, and then we have this ratio of carbon, uh, which you might look at and think that looks weird. It's just talking about carbon isotopes. Um, so they're just talking about these carbon isotopes being more similar to fossilized organisms than to rock, which supports that it's a, a fossil. Uh, 
we can also see that this little guy uh, on the screen, he's potentially dividing. And that is some pretty cool stuff, if I do say so myself. Uh, and this leads us to the question, is this the first life on Earth? Um, or is it a descendant that we just haven't found those other fossil records yet? Which, for the record, for a cell like this to have fossilized is pretty astronomical and very rare. Um, there's a lot of things that you might think of like, oh, there must be tons of fossils. There's only like, you could probably count on like just your hands, how many full Tyrannosaurus Rex fossils, like fully formed skeletons there are. Um, there's very few, there's not as many as you might think. So let's jump into, okay, so we have life on Earth. What about all these crazy species? We want to talk about diversity. So we can look at two humans and easily recognize that this man and this woman are both humans of the same species. They are the same. But to an untrained eye, I suppose, looking at these two uh, other organisms, the Persian buttercup and the pink rose, or the Bornean orangutan and the golden lion tamarind, they look similar to each other, but they're not the same species. And we know that they can't be the same species. Big thing we know is because they can't reproduce. We can look at the man and the woman and say, yeah, if they got together and mated, there's a good chance that they could produce an offspring together because they're the same species these roses and these two primates would not. So it means that they cannot be the same species. So exactly what I just said, we want to define species and species are going to have a lot to do with their ability to breed with each other. Um, so we do have this term biological species concept and it's going to encompass what a species is. And we'll talk more about this biological species concept here in a second. But species are natural populations of organisms that are able to interbreed with each other or could possibly interbreed. Um, and then the other big thing is that they cannot interbreed with organisms outside their own group, which we're going to call reproductive isolation. So here we have the biological species concept. So what this concept is going to do is it's going to ignore physical appearance um, because males and females of the same species often look very different. Uh, so we're just going to ignore that. The big thing is it's going to uh, depend heavily on that concept of reproductive isolation. And it's composed of two parts. One, uh, the ability to interbreed despite distance uh, is capable, meaning if you went online and you were in like a chat room and you started talking up somebody, um, let's say in another country like Japan, if you're in the US and you're talking to someone in Japan and you really hit it off and then eventually you want to, you know, be more intimate with that person, maybe start a family, who knows, that distance, that huge distance doesn't make a difference because you can still breed with that person. Um, they are still the same species. You can still breed with them despite that distance. The second thing going into biological species concept is that we are under the assumption that natural conditions are occurring. Uh, in captivity, individuals may interbreed that would not normally in the wild. For example, um, this funky little guy over here, uh, he is known as a Zorse, uh, which is a zebra and a horse combination. Um, I think a Hebra actually sounds cooler, but hey, that's just me. Anyway, so we've got this guy who is this crazy amalgamation of kind of horse, kind of zebra, a little bit of both. Um, but this wouldn't occur naturally. Yes, we can force that situation. Um, but in the wild, you would never have two species like a zebra and a horse mating. Um, that is exclusively because of human uh, interception. So we need to talk about barriers to reproduction. So we have these two terms, prezygotic and postzygotic barriers. 
Um, remember that when we talk about when a sperm and an egg come together, that's known as a zygote. And that zygote is sort of what we're sort of kind of kind of a little bit talking about. Um, so prezygotic barriers are going to be things where individuals are physically unable to mate with each other. For example, this beautiful German Shepherd and a pig. They cannot mate. Even if they did mate, that sperm and that egg would not be able to combine. So that is a prezygotic barrier. Postzygotic barriers are going to have more to do with matings that produce a hybrid individual that do not survive long after fertilization. Or if a hybrid offspring were to survive, they're infertile and they have, or they have reduced fertility. Um, a good example, going back to kind of horses, is when you combine a horse and a donkey, they make something called a mule. Mules, I believe, are almost always female and they are infertile. They cannot mate with other mules and they cannot mate with horses or donkeys to create um, an offspring. So they're not able to do that. So how do we name species now that we've talked about there being a bunch of them and how to uh, sort of define them? Um, we need an organizational system. And we have Carolus Linnaeus in the mid 1700s stepping up to the plate, uh, coming up with a uh, system in order to uh, define a species as far as terminology. So. Uh, the two parts to the scientific name for a species is going to be the genus and then the specific epithet. Um, so, for example, uh, humans, their um, species name is going to be Homo sapien. Homo is the genus and sapien is the specific epithet. Um, Homo sapien actually translates into wise man and a lot of this is going to stem into um, the language Latin. Um, Latin is a, a very nice language and if you ever take classes that have a lot of species names, if this class inspires you to go on to taking a zoology class or something, or mammalogy or ornithology or herpetology or whatever you want to take, a uh, study of animals, you're going to have to learn a lot of the species names for those classes and Latin is going to be your new best friend. Um, or your worst enemy, depending on how well your uh, your ability to remember things is. Um, regardless, when it comes to writing out these Latin species names, we are going to have to capitalize the genus uh, and italicize everything. Um, that is the big important thing. You want to write it out properly. So if we were using uh, back to zebras, for some reason we can't get away from them in this lecture, if we were going to try to organize the kind of everything, uh, the organization of a zebra using the Linnaean system, uh, this is how we would do it. So the Linnaean system is hierarchical, which I'm sure I butchered that word, but whatever. But we are going to start with something that is very, very broad, and then we are going to get into a much more specific range of uh, classifications. So we are starting with the domain. Domains are going to only be composed of three uh, things, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And we will talk about what kind of each one is here in a second. Um, if you can't guess, eukarya is going to be everything that is a eukaryote. So a zebra does fall under that classification within the domain eukarya. From eukarya, eukarya has four kingdoms, protista, plant, fungi, and animalia. And of course we know zebras don't fall into those other three, they fall into animalia. From animalia, we split up into a handful of different phylums. You don't need to know them all. Uh, just know that we are going to go into the phylum chordata. And chordata is just going to refer to animals that have a notochord or a spinal cord. So we're in chordata. From chordata, we are going to want to pick a class 
within the phylum chordata, we have a handful of different classes. The one that we are going to choose for zebras is mammalia. From there, we're going to go into an order called parasodactylia, which try saying that 10 times fast. I know I couldn't. From there, we're going to choose a family, which um, the family that zebras fall into is the same as horses, uh, which is equidae. And then we have to choose our genus, which is equus. And then the species all together is equus quagga. So that is the actual species name of our zebra. So it falls down uh, this hierarchical system uh, and you don't always have to get every little thing on there as long as you can get to that species name. That's the most important thing and I will not ask you to do that for the record. Not in lab and not in this class. Just want to show you how it's done. So species are not always so easily to define. We are going to go through each of these um, concepts uh, that support why it's not so easy to use the biological species concept to classify everything. So the first part is going to be that there's difficulties in classifying asexual species. So anything that reproduces asexually, whether this is um, bacteria or viruses or um, prokaryotes, as well as plants. Some plants reproduce asexually. Um, some snails do as well. Um, various other organisms do. Uh, but in this case, what would happen is we would essentially classify every new individual after a species reproduced asexually as a new species. The offspring would all be new species, which we know that isn't the case. It can't be the case. Um, so that is the classification of the biological species concept um, because you have to have according to the biological species concept, groups of interbreeding individuals. But you can't do that with species that reproduce asexually. So that is one of the shortcomings. The next is difficulties in classifying fossil species. Uh, we have no idea what species could have reproduced with other species based on fossil records. Um, there's no way for us to go back in time or look at those various organisms um, naturally in the wild and see who they could have uh, reproduced with. It's just very difficult. So that's another shortcoming of the biological uh, species concept. The next is going to involve something called a ring species. The example I have is called a greenish warbler. They're not bluish, they're not yellowish, they're greenish. And actually, I don't even think they look all that green. I should have put a picture on here. My apologies. Regardless, it's a type of bird that lives at the base of a mountain. And uh, this mountain is going to be in Central Asia. Uh, and so they live around the base of the mountain because they can't live at higher altitudes. Uh, so the altitude at the base of the mountain is perfect for them. But what happens is that two non-interbreeding populations are connected by gene flow through the populations within the ring. So once you get all the way around the mountain, you can't have this breeding anymore, but they're still the same species. You have these sort of intermediate zones too, as you can see from this little picture. But once you get all the way around, they can't breed with each other there. Uh, there are over 20 ring species known to biologists, um, and uh, yeah, they just don't fit into that biological species concept. The next is going to be uh, hybrid species. Um, it's hard to uh, fit these into this concept um, because hybrids maybe can interbreed with each other or other parent species. Sometimes, mostly, often they cannot. Um, the borders between the species is relatively unclear. 
and it's just hard to classify one from the other. So what is a better way to classify species um, rather than the biological species concept? And that is the morphological species concept, which is an alternative approach to defining species using physical features. Anytime you see that term morphological or morph or whatever, it's referring to shape. Um, in this case, we are referring probably more than anything to physical features like bones, as well as other um, features on an animal such as teeth um, or claws or things of that nature. So how do new species arise now that we've talked about um, all the ways that they can be diverse? Well, 5 million to 100 million species currently live on Earth, and I know that seems like a really big range because we haven't found them all. There are still new species being discovered uh, every day. It's kind of cool. So this term speciation is when one species splits into two distinct species, and speciation has two distinct phases. The first is reproductive isolation, which we've talked about, and genetic divergence. So reproductive isolation, just to remind you, is the uh, separation of populations from one another. And what inevitably, inevitably comes from that is genetic divergence, which is where those different populations start to evolve separately to accumulate physical and behavioral features over time. Uh, so one definitely influences the other. So there are a few different types of speciation, uh, and this is the first. We have allopatric speciation, where we have ge geographical isolation that can result in genetic divergence. So the example that I have for you are these two types of ground squirrels, uh, the Harris antelope and the white-tailed antelope ground squirrel. They look so similar but they cannot breed with each other due to this allopatric speciation occurring. So from this diagram, we have an initial population. They're all hanging out, reproducing, doing their thing. And then something happens to form a barrier between our population. So we have some of the population on one side of a barrier, let's say it's a river, and then some of our population on the other side of the river, which this now has caused um, reproductive isolation to occur. So from there, through time, our two halves of the population are not interbreeding. They cannot do anything about it. They can't cross the river, they can't swim, they can't jump, they can't fly. So what happens is through time, we get genetic, genetic divergence. So that evolution is occurring for both halves of that initial population, but so much so through time that they wouldn't be able to breed even if they could cross that river um, at all. So that is geographic isolation, which is the most common type of speciation. You can also think of it as allopatric speciation being Alloway over there, so there's a distance. Sorry if that's too corny for you. Another example is the Galapagos finches. Um, you'll notice that they all look relatively similar, um, and that is because they would have originated from that mainland finch and then found their way to other uh, islands where reproductive isolation would have occurred. Um, and then from their genetic divergence. The other type of speciation is known as sympatric speciation. Uh, this is speciation without geographic isolation. It's relatively rare among vertebrates, but it's actually pretty common among plants. And it actually occurs in potentially two ways. So these two scenarios can lead to sympatric speciation. You don't need to know the process. Just have an understanding that the first uh, chromosome duplication within a single species is talking about a mutation. 
uh, while the second combining chromosomes from two different species is talking about creating a hybrid. Um, so that is essentially the two scenarios that can cause sympatric speciation. The history of life can be imagined as a tree, and I think this is always a really good visualization, um, especially when talking about something called a phylogeny, which is the evolutionary history of an organism, which it's not always a single organism, sometimes it's multiple organisms, sometimes it's all organisms. It just sort of depends on what you want to look at and how certain species or organisms relate to each other. Uh, and so how we do this is called systematics, uh, which is going to classify species based on common ancestry. So here we have a phylogenetic tree, sometimes known as an evolutionary tree. Phylogenies, very important thing to distinguish, are hypotheses, and they are always subject to revision. They don't tell us uh, what species is more primitive, um, but it does tell us who is more related. So evolutionary trees show us an ancestor descendant relationship. Uh, branches are evolutionary on evolutionary trees can be spun around the nodes, which are going to be those little uh, those dots. So the circles that have some type of forking coming off of them, they're splitting off uh, various species from there. Uh, and actually, from this evolutionary tree of life, which is sort of the um, accepted tree, if you will, uh, including bacteria, archaea, eukarya, which are those three domains, and then amongst eukarya, we have the uh, four kingdoms. Um, what this tells us is, one, protists have evolved three separate times, and fungi are more related to animals than plants, which is kind of a weird, cool thing to think about, in my opinion. When talking about phylogenies, we need to look at a term called a monophyletic group. So members of these groups share a common ancestor, and the group contains all of the descendants of that ancestor. In the example that we're looking at between mammals, lizards, crocodiles, and birds, we can see that birds and crocodiles have a common ancestor, which is represented as A. This means that they are a monophyletic group, but crocodiles and lizards are not a monophyletic group, and this is due to the fact that B, that common ancestor, is also shared with birds. So it just needs to include um, just the members that are from that single common ancestor and not from, uh, multiple common ancestors. So constructing an evolutionary tree using comparative anatomy, so this is using that morphology again. Uh, so before DNA sequencing became available, physical features of species were used to determine evolutionary relatedness. We'd ask questions like, does it possess a retractable claws, a uh, number of chambers in the ear bone? Yes, you can figure that out, and it's super crazy fun. And then my favorite, does the penis have a bone, which is known as a baculum, actually. It's super cool. So from these questions, we can start comparing various species and see that African lions and spotted hyenas uh, share a lot of qualities, as do gray wolves and black bears, so that we can start to organize these various species on our phylogenies based on their morphology. But of course, we can always use um, our, our DNA sequencing to compare evolutionary trees. Uh, so this is probably a better way to do it, but it's also a more involved and more expensive way uh, to look at the relatedness between various species on a genetic level. Something we need to talk about is the fact that similar structures don't always reveal a common ancestor. For instance, Bats versus flying insects. Both have wings, but that doesn't mean that they share a common ancestor, uh, at least not super close to each other. As we can see, there's one, two, three, four common ancestors before we have a common ancestor be between bats and insects. 
what we call this is convergent evolution. And there's two different sort of features that we need to talk about. The first is analogous trace and oh, analogous traits, which an example is what we were just talking about, the bats and insects having wings. This is a type of convergent evolution, but there is no common ancestor that had wings to where both of those species have wings. There's a good chance that their common ancestor didn't have wings, was a wingless ancestor. And then we have homologous features. Um, so these are features from a common ancestor, the example being all mammals having hair. Uh, so. We can also sort of distinguish uh, the two a little bit more easily using DNA analysis. The next thing we want to talk about is macroevolution versus microevolution. Uh, microevolution is going to produce small changes in a population, yet accumulation of these changes over a long span of time can be, uh, in this example, canyonesque. The idea I want to get across to you is that microevolution can cause macroevolution. Microevolution are these small changes. For example, like the Grand Canyon, where we have water moving through rocks, and it's taking years and years and years until you get something as stupendous as the Grand Canyon. That is a lot of small changes, microevolution, accumulating in just this big canyon event, which is that macroevolution. So here are the uh, definitions of both, but the one thing I really want to get across is that they are the same. Uh, the only difference is macroevolution is the accumulated effects of microevolution, and microevolution is the change in allele frequencies over one or a few generations. So they're small things that make a big thing. Uh, they both have everything to do with a change in allele frequencies, exactly what we've been talking about uh, when talking about evolution. Talking about micro and macro evolution, we want to talk about the pace of evolution occurring. And it can be fast and it can be slow. What scientists refer to as fast and slow evolution, uh, the first is evolution by creeps. This is going to be gradual increments or steps uh, of evolution or evolution by jerks. These are long periods of relatively little evolutionary change. Uh, that are punctuated by bursts of rapid change. Um, so that punctuated equilibrium uh, are those long periods of relatively no change um, punctuated by bursts of rapid change. Next thing we want to talk about is adaptive radiation. This is when a small number of species diversifies into a much larger number of species. Um, you've probably heard of the um, Cambrian uh, explosion or various other explosions of life on Earth. Um, one of the big ones is the mammalian radiation, uh, where adaptive radiations um, have occurred throughout history. The mammalian radiation is directly the cause of humans evolving and being created. Uh, so kind of cool stuff. Adaptive radiation, uh, there are three types of phenomena that can lead to it. Um, the first is mass extinction event events, which their competition uh, suddenly is eliminated. Uh, and the remaining species can rapidly diversify. This is what happened with the mammalian radiation. Colonization events, so moving to a new location with new resources and possibly fewer competitors, and colonizers can rapidly diversify. Um, this happens every so often, especially in various species. Uh, we can think of Darwin's finches as colonization events. There were no predators on those islands to uh, affect them. Evolutionary innovations uh, is the third. So with the evolution of an innovative feature that increases fitness, a species can rapidly diversify, such as with the um, uh, feature of wings. Uh, becoming available to various insects. So there have been several mass extinctions on Earth, and just to give you um, a 
definition of an extinction is the complete loss of all individuals in a species population. So we do have background versus mass extinctions. There are two different types. So mass extinctions is a large number of species becoming extinct over a short period of time due to extraordinary and sudden environmental changes, while background extinctions uh, occur at a lower rate during times other than mass extinctions. From this graph, we can see that there have been five major mass extinctions and then background extinctions occurring um, you know, throughout. So probably the coolest one, as far as the name goes, is the Great Dying, um, which sounds awful, but I mean, it sounds really metal. Uh, that was where, uh, during the Permian period, 96% of all species uh, was wiped out from Earth. You know, that's a really large number of species. Um, it was potentially caused from the formation of the supercontinent Pangaea. Um, there was a lot of climate change going on as well as volcanoes erupting. The one that you probably are the most familiar with is going to be the extinction of the dinosaurs. Um, so three-fourths of all species on Earth went extinct due to a meteor. So that happened about 65 million years ago. Um, and again, lots of dinosaurs died, but that made way for mammals to really take their place and for humans to evolve. If you are familiar with current events, you'll know that there's a bit of climate change going on, uh, and I'll try not to get on a soapbox here. Um, but if you're quite interested in this topic, which I highly recommend you um, looking into these various things, I think it's important to learn about your world. Um, the book, The Sixth Extinction by Elizabeth Colbert is a very a fantastic book that talks about various features uh, that support that we are currently in the sixth extinction uh, on Earth because there are a lot of species that are dying out um, and a lot of them are caused by climate change as well as humans in general. Uh, so instead of a meteor or volcanoes, this sixth extinction is being caused by humans. So good book, really good book. Check it out if you're interested. So all living organisms are divided into one of three groups. Um, so these are those three domains, bacteria, um, archaea, which are, includes um, prokaryotes, and that's different than bacteria, a different classification, and of course eukarya, which includes plants, animals, protists, and fungi. Uh, Linnaeus originally created a two kingdom system, but it was really inadequate plants and animals and then, you know, mineral kingdom for non-living matter. But this, this wasn't something that we considered part of the kingdoms, minerals. Um, <clears throat> we only want to include living uh, things. The thing he didn't take into account was microbes. Um, some can move like animals and some make their own food like plants, but they need their own place to exist. And that is why we created protists, as well as we couldn't forget the fungi eventually. So the five kingdom system of classifications. The only thing I want you to get from this slide essentially is that the five kingdom system was discarded in the 1970s to the 1980s. <coughs> And that is because these classifications were based on solely appearance, and that just wasn't enough. Another gentleman, uh, Carl Wosey, um, and his colleagues examined nucleotide sequences and ribosomal RNA. They discovered that microbes were quite diverse. They weren't all um, just bacteria, if you will. So they discovered a new prokaryote, or archaea, um, and created that that second domain uh, that we see there on the slide. They also realized that archaea was more closely related to eukarya, and we're gonna talk about that uh, in just a second. Wosey's approach isn't imperfect, uh, but it's not perfect. <laughs> um, protists are not a monophyletic group. 
And bacteria sometimes engage in horizontal gene transfer, which is just passing genes between species. Um, and viruses are not included in the tree of life because they lack an independent metabolism. So kind of by our definition, viruses aren't alive, even though they kind of are, but they aren't somewhere in between. So here we've got the origin of life uh, tree. Um, so we have bacteria arising from the first self-replicating metabolizing cells like we were talking at the beginning of this lecture. Uh, there was a split between the bacteria and a line uh, that gave rise to the archaea and the eukarya. So somewhere we have that split going on, uh, which means that archaea and eukarya arose from some type of common ancestor with bacteria. And then the fusion of a bacterium and an archaean like prokaryote gave rise to the eukarya, which then split from the archaea line. So we can see these common ancestors and these various spots in time, which are big history events uh, that led to the rise of protists, plants, fungi, and animals, and us, essentially. And that is actually the end of chapter 12. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I hope you found at least something mildly interesting with this chapter. Uh, if you have any questions, don't forget you can always email me and of course make good choices and have a good rest of your day.